In May of 2013, Leicester City and Watford FC faced off in the second leg of the semi-finals of the playoffs to decide who would be promoted to the Premier League. Watford lost the first leg 1-0 away, so they would need to win here at home to stay alive. The events of this day will belong to four men who are all here at the ground, one on the touchline and three on the field. Their whining stories will all reach a dramatic inflection point at Vicarage Road in this match, one of the most memorable moments in footballing history, and then those stories will spear off in diverse and unexpected trajectories. The story of the events at Vicarage Road on May 12th, 2013 draw their roots far back. And for all of its drama, it starts with, of all things, one of the funniest moments in World Cup history. In the 76th minute of the 1994 World Cup quarterfinal match between Nigeria and Italy, things were about to go horribly wrong for Italy, as they tended to do in the late 80s and early 90s. Gianfranco Zola got the ball while streaking down the left side. Italy were losing 1-0 at the time to one of the greatest African sides ever assembled and would need to do something to preserve their World Cup lives as the game wound down. Zola makes some dribble moves and attempts to bypass his defender, Augustina Guavoen, but the Nigerian center back fights to get goal side and Zola, in the process of being muscled off the ball fairly, kind of flings himself to the turf. Looking for a penalty, he gets nothing from the ref. So Zola, clearly a bit frustrated, sends in a decisive challenge to try and recover the ball from Aguavuen, but the referee calls a foul. It's probably fair, as the challenge was a little rough, but Zola has the right to feel hard done by after ending up with the ball at the end of the day. The referee steps up and shows the red card. The foul call might have been iffy, but the decision to send Zola off here is completely indefensible. And instead of the usual protestations we see after receiving an unjust red card, Zola simply curls up. He sinks to the turf on his knees and just folds up, completely physically unable to accept the referee's decision. While in the background, Sunday Olise appears on the scene to celebrate his teammate's apparent injury. In the moment, especially for Zola and the rest of the Italian supporters, it must have been infuriating, but with 30 years of hindsight, it's honestly pretty funny. In another irony though, Nigeria, even with a man advantage, couldn't hold on, and Roberto Baggio's two goals would send Italy to the next round, ensuring that their World Cup was not remembered for Zola's red card and subsequent antics. Instead, Bajo himself dragged that team to an improbable final appearance, only to miss the decisive penalty himself in the final shootout. For Zola, though, it was mostly bad news for a while after that red card, at least on the national side. His suspension was over once Italy reached the final, but he wouldn't play in that match. He would remain a hugely talented player for years to come, but for the World Cup in 1998, Italy already had Baggio and Alessandro Del Piero. Zola's role was already filled, and he would be left out of that roster and retired from international football on the back of it. That meant that the last World Cup image of Gianfranco Zola, one of the best Italian players of the 90s, is his mini tantrum at being dismissed in Boston. In his club life, Zola spent the years preceding 1994 developing at Napoli and learning from a fellow diminutive superstar in Diego Maradona. However, in 1993 he left Napoli due to financial troubles at the club and went to Parma where he had an immediate breakout season leading to his World Cup selection. Even in the season after his 1994 misfortune, Zola kept up his success, scoring 19 goals and almost bringing the Scudetto to Parma. The next year, despite his contributions previously, he found himself not needed within Ancelotti's rigid system and moved to Chelsea. There, he finally blossomed and fulfilled his potential. He brought silverware to Chelsea over a seven-year stretch, 
eventually coming to be recognized as Chelsea's greatest ever player in a fan poll, although he would be unseated for that honor by a generation of stars in the late 2000s and early 2010s. Zola would spend a couple seasons at Cagliari before retiring, and then returned to London to manage West Ham. A couple years later, he found himself on the touchline at Watford. The season that led Watford to the playoff against Leicester is his first at the club, and it took Zola a while to find his feet. After Watford at one point sunk to 20th in the championship, they found a rhythm and rolled through the rest of the season to third place, playing with an attacking style and scoring 12 more goals than any other side in the competition. At the end of each EFL championship season, three teams get promoted to the Premier League. First and second go through automatically, but instead of the third going through automatically, the third spot is decided in a playoff between teams three through six. Watford lost the first leg of the playoff to Leicester, so they would need to find some more of that attacking flair to reach the playoff final. At home, they started off on the front foot, and Watford immediately got good chances. Watford's Mate Vidra, on a 13-game cold streak, gets a chance early but makes a mess of it, and the game stays goalless. The next opportunity for Watford, their most dangerous player wriggles free of the Leicester defense and has a crack from range and almost finds the net, but is denied by Kasper Schmeichel. Schmeichel is the son of Manchester United legend Peter Schmeichel, actually the goalkeeper that Zola scored on on that crafty, dribbling finish for Chelsea. Casper got his start on the books for Manchester City, United's crosstown rivals, but only ever appeared in eight games in blue, instead spending time out on loan to five different clubs, consistently impressing but never finding a place. In 09, City cut him loose officially, and he found his way to League 2 Knotts County. In a super impressive campaign, he attracted championship and even Premier League interest and transferred for Leeds United. As the son of a legendary keeper, Casper would always have to be compared in some way to his father. And while Peter Schmeichel was able to put down roots in Manchester and play out basically the entire 90s in red, His son's career was conversely defined entirely by impermanence, never once staying in the same place for more than one season. During those three hectic years on the books at Manchester City, where he was loaned out five times, he never even played more than 30 games at one location. At multiple of those loan destinations, he expressed a desire to stay, to extend his time, but he never got his wish of a permanent assignment. After he impressed at Knotts and transferred to Leeds, he was finally offered a multi-year contract, a two-year deal at Leeds. With that greater sense of stability in his back pocket, he shined, and ironically, he did just well enough to see that hard-won stability wrenched out from under him. In the off-season of the best year of his career, Leeds sold him on to Leicester, his eighth club in five years, and he would have to carve out a place for himself once again again in a new side. In 2011-12, he would have another career best season with 17 clean sheets, earning Club Player of the Year honors. Finally, he could stay in the same place for multiple campaigns as Leicester kept the Dane around for 2012-13 and he did not disappoint. Schmeichel had a monster first half of the season, which was punctuated by this incredible reaction save against Blackburn, and he had his club dreaming of a Premier League promotion that year. However, they stumbled in the second half and slumped to 8th place before the final day, two spots out of the playoff positions. In the last day of the season, they had to go to Nottingham Forest ground. The Tricky Trees were in 7th, also gunning for that final playoff spot in sixth. In order to steal it, Leicester would need a win against Forrest, and they would need for Bolton to stumble in their final match. 
With Leicester's score at 1-1, Andrew King netted a go-ahead for Leicester from an Anthony Knockart cross, but Forrest would get back level through an Elliott Ward strike. With the time winding down for Leicester, Bolton would go full-time with a draw, meaning that the winner of this match would go into the playoff, but they couldn't score as 90 minutes were up. In stoppage time, in the last gasp, Leicester still needed a goal. Forrest, also looking for a goal to send them into the playoff, pushed high up the pitch, opening up gaps in their defense. As one of their attacks fizzled, a dramatic counterattack ensued in extra time, and this control in space from Knockart sent the Foxes off to the races. On a 1-2, Knockart would get the final touch and celebrate in front of a wall of blue in the away end, sending Leicester to the playoff with a chance of promotion. Anthony Knockart was the hero. The French striker's career was just getting started at Leicester. In his first season with the Foxes after impressing in his first senior team campaigns with an ascending Guingamp side in France. The goal against Forrest was his first signature moment in blue. The promising start to what could be a great career for Leicester. With Leicester holding Watford goalless and still winning 1-0 on aggregate, it looked like Knockard's heroics had paid off, currently on course to send them to the Wembley Stadium finale of the playoffs. Watford kept pushing though, and they finally found their equalizer as Vidra broke his cold streak with an acrobatic volley. But Leicester would go back in front with a goal from Ted Nugent, putting them once again in aggregate winning position. In the 65th minute, Vidra was streaking forward in an attacking area once again and found Troy Deeney, who returned the ball right back to Vidra as he leveled the aggregate score with his second goal of the match. Vidra was the hero of the day for now, having scored both goals so far, but the real engine of Watford's attack all afternoon, and all season really, was Troy Deeney. Troy Deeney's career is one of the most intriguing sagas in football history. He had a troubled upbringing, at one time being expelled from school, but his talent was undeniable. Despite that, his footballing career was on the rocks at the age that most stars go pro. At age 18, Deeney had decided to start training as a bricklayer and played only as a semi-pro in the 11th tier of English football with Chelmsley Town. On one day, they suited up to play Walsall's academy team with the opponent's director of youth in attendance to watch his son play. There were a couple of barriers in Deeney's way during this game, meaning he probably wasn't 100%. For one, he had to spend most of his days at his day job, leaving him little time to train and probably making him quite tired. During the game, Troy Deeney also was completely drunk there is no footage that survives from this 11th tier clash, but the scoreline tells us enough. In what must have been one of the most chaotic footballing performances in history, Deeney led his side to an 11-4 victory, scoring seven of those himself. Having thoroughly impressed Walsall's club rep in attendance, Deeney would get signed to the club soon after the match, and his career would take off finally spending a year on loan to Hales Owen before finding a consistent spot at Walsall, where he impressed enough to transfer, in 2010, to Watford. That upwards momentum which took him to the top echelons of English football was temporary though. Even at the best ranked side of Deeney's career, he was kept out of those roles where he played his best, like Zola at Parma and Schmeichel at Manchester City. Deeney struggled in his first season making an uncomfortable switch to the right wing, but in 2011, Watford got a new manager in Sean Dyche, who recognized Deeney's talent when played in his proper role at striker, and Deeney got the opportunities he needed. 
he led the team in goals and got Watford's goal of the season for this effort against Ipswich Town. Yeah, that's a new low for footage quality there. However, even with such a good showing, Deeney couldn't fully get away from his past and never shook the rash, short-fused reputation that he had built up, partially unfairly and partially by his own doing. In 2012, he was involved in a brawl outside a pub that left one man with a broken jaw and others injured. For his actions during the fight, Deeney was imprisoned for a little under three months during the 2012 offseason. Amidst a career and ultimately a life full of contrasting highs and lows, this was among the lowest points for him. He would later say that his grief after his father's cancer diagnosis contributed to those actions and he would also say that his prison sentence and counseling afterwards helped him to grow into a better person. Dini returned to action in early September. He made an impact right away for the squad, scoring the winner against Huddersfield Town from the penalty spot, breaking a four-game winless streak for his side. In his best season to date, Deeney would score 19 goals in all competitions entering the playoff. He almost had another goal after that and even found the net, but was stopped by the offsides flag. Despite those near misses and the troubles that pervaded his season, he has undoubtedly been a true leader at the heart of Watford's structure, having set up Vidra's aggregate equalizer in the playoff today. With the aggregate still even, stoppage time beckons. Anthony Knockart, the hero who sent Leicester to the playoff, gets the ball just outside the box. He dribbled in and went down way easy under a challenge from Cassetti, but the referee comes up and points to the spot. Knockart himself goes up to take the resulting penalty, looking to make a second, even more memorable stamp on his Leicester City season. The man who sent Leicester to this stage has a chance to do one better and take them to Wembley Stadium with a chance to reach the Premier League with a win. Seeing Knockart's dive get rewarded must have been a familiar feeling for Gianfranco Zola. He might have thought of that dive by Aguavoen back in 1994 that ended his World Cup career after the ludicrous red card he got sent off with. And he might have even thought of his own dive that he did moments before that. Only Knockarts was successful in garnering the penalty call. The Spanish goalkeeper Manuel Almunia stands in and Knockart steps up. With the game and the season for both sides on his boot. Absolutely astonishing. The first words of the commentary after Almunia's double save are the only ones that can remotely sum up this moment. Troy Deeney was the unlikeliest of heroes. There are so many reasons that Deeney might not have gotten that chance in front of net against Leicester to pull off the most dramatic of victories. From his troubled upbringing to the penalty kick that should have ended their season there. Dini didn't do it alone, not without Almunia's saves, Cassetti's clearance, Forestieri's cross, and Jonathan Hogg's perfect header out into space to find him, 
but of course, it's his name by which this goal is remembered. The game ends right there, and fans storm the pitch, understandable after seeing that sort of goal. And Leicester, the losing side of the greatest moment in playoff history, can do nothing but watch. It's Watford who will go to historic Wembley Stadium to continue their story and play for a berth into the Premier League. Naturally, having built up such momentum after a climactic victory and making the final, they lose. In a Wembley Stadium playoff final where they showed none of the attacking flair that had brought them so far, a goalless scoreline crept into extra time, where Marco Cassetti was called for another penalty foul. Only this time it really was a foul, and Manuel Amunia couldn't stop the resulting shot. Game over. This season and the clash between Watford and Leicester remind, like no other, that what you think is the end often isn't so. Watford couldn't end up writing the conclusion to their perfect story, and instead had to sit in the championship for a little longer. None of these stories really ended here, although for some of them it was the central moment. These paths kept running, through May 12th and onwards. Both teams, all four of these men, eliminated at different stages but all sent back to the championship had to pick up the pieces and continue in a new season. Zola, the manager who led Watford with the flair that had them scoring 86 goals in the season, would be the first to take his exit. Watford opened their 2013-14 campaign on a slump, and after they wallowed to 13th, went two months without a win, and tanked five straight home losses, Zola resigned as manager of Watford before the year was out. After Dini and Knockart, Zola was the third person the cameras found amid the chaos after the playoff winner, running around between fans like Jim Valvano, and just seven months after it, he was out. After managing Watford, he bounced around season by season, as managers so often do, going back to Cagliari, then to a Qatari club, then Birmingham before spending 2018-19 as an assistant at Chelsea. That would be his last coaching post at time of writing. He's currently the vice president of a division of Italy's third tier. He hasn't managed for the last five seasons, and it's hard to see him leaving the administrative side anytime soon. Even though he is the goalkeeper that the goal will count against, it's really hard to fault Kasper Schmeichel for the events of 12th of May. He did sell all the way out to try and block Jonathan Hogg's header and was left far out of position for Dini's strike, but there's probably not much he could have done even if he was properly set up in net. The blame nevertheless fell on other men than him, and the sting of that playoff defeat didn't stick on his personal record, and that let him finally find a home at Leicester, at the time probably the best player in their squad. After he left Leeds, Schmeichel got signed to a three-year deal from Leicester, and in year three, the year after Dini's winner, he was the last line of defense as Leicester stormed to the top of the table and comfortably attained promotion. With a cash influx after reaching the Premier League, Leicester improved their side around two existing talents in Schmeichel and Jamie Vardy, a pure goal scorer who was on the bench during the Watford playoff. With a plethora of smart transfers, they began to build a pantheon in blue and white. Riyad Mahrez and Leonardo Ochoa starred in 2014-15 as the team finished 14th, after occupying 20th place for 18 match weeks and being in relegation land with six games remaining. However, they stormed back with a series of wins that saved them from the drop. When faced with the prospect of a one-year stay in the Premier League followed by instant relegation, Leicester City survived. In the stretch that saved them, Schmeichel got five clean sheets across nine matches. In that offseason, they would sign N'Golo Kante and Shinji Okazaki, and all the stars would align for the Foxes. Famously, little Leicester City would come out of nowhere and win the league, with games to spare, Schmeichel is keeper in all 38 league fixtures. 
he kept 16 clean sheets. This is the true irony of Watford's glorious moment. Without Dini's winner, Leicester would not have been in the position to win the league just three years later. The stars really had a line for the Foxes. They had flown just enough under the radar in 1415 for their best players to be able to develop one year further without getting poached by larger squads. And the next season just happened to be a weaker year than usual for the top clubs. While Leicester's set of stars each had a breakout season or their career best. If they had made their appearance in the top flight just one season earlier than they did. That is to say, if Knockart had hit his penalty and then Leicester had won the final, they would not have had their crowning moment atop the mountain of English football just three years later. Among everyone in this story, what could have been for Anthony Knockers? In the next season, he would fight to avenge his penalty kick miss in the playoff defeat, and made 50 appearances across the grueling season where Leicester topped the championship table in a rebound year. They made the jump to the top flight, no playoff needed, and just like that, the goal that had narrowly eluded Knockart was accomplished. It was done. They were in the Prem. In the top flight though, that revamped Leicester side suddenly had no place for Anthony Knockhart, and he spent time in the reserve team and only found sparse minutes coming off the bench. With his three-year deal up at the end of the first Premier League year, he was offered a four-year contract to stay with Leicester. Knockhart would have known at the time that this would have been a minor role in the model of his previous campaign. He would have been trading playing time for stability. What he couldn't have known is that this contract would have landed him a role in a Premier League winning campaign. Instead of taking the opportunity, he turned it down to play on a one-year deal with Standard Liège in Belgium and missed out on that historic season. At Liège, he impressed enough to find himself a mid-year transfer to Brighton in the championship again. In his second season with the Seagulls, he would have his best campaign yet. He scored 15 goals in 45 league games and became the EFL Championship Player of the Year and led Brighton to promotion. After his status at Leicester had waned into nothing and he transferred out, he had come out of relative obscurity and led another championship side to promotion with his best ever campaign. After two years at Brighton, though, in the Premier League, he saw his role declining once again. He got loaned out to Fulham, and the London team made the move permanent for 2020-21. In that season, Knockhart was limited in playing time, but Fulham gained promotion, the third promotion side that Knockhart had been on. Once again, Fulham had no spot for him in the top flight and he would go to Nottingham Forest after, another championship side, then to a Greek club, then another championship squad in Huddersfield, before going to Valenciennes in French Ligue 2, where he plays now. Knockart was the king of the second division. He left in his wake a career where he was too good for the championship multiple years, but not good enough for the Premier League ever. Despite that magnificent 2016-17 campaign with Brighton and a couple goal of the month winners throughout his career, he's naturally only really remembered though for missing that penalty against Watford. That just leaves Deeney out of these four men who played their roles in this story. After that deflating loss to Crystal Palace, Deeney scored 24 in the failed rebound season where they fired Zola then became captain of the squad as they cruised to second place in the next year that saw them promoted, only losing out on the second tier title after a draw on the final day that allowed Burnmouth to swipe it from under them. In the promotion year, Troy Deeney led his squad from the front once again, 
the top goal scorer for them with 21 in the league campaign, the only Watford player in history to have three consecutive 20 goal seasons. That began a lengthy stay in the Premier League for them, with Dini always at the fore, captaining his side through the world's toughest club competition, still showing his goal scoring, though of course not at the same rate as he had done against inferior competition in the second division. For someone whose career had started so strangely and who had lucky breaks, dizzying highs, setbacks, and general chaos like almost no other, he did possibly the most unlikely thing he could have done. He became just another part of the landscape. Barring a couple controversies across the rest of his career, he became just an elder statesman and a talented player on a team locked in the mid to bottom table. He was the face of Watford, but never more. They peaked at 11th place and once made it to the FA Cup final before being thumped 6-0 by Man City. Watford got relegated in 2020, and Dini would play 19 games and score 7 in the next year that saw them immediately promoted back to the top flight. Then he would leave Watford for his hometown Birmingham City in the beginning of the 21-22 season. Dini's legacy at Watford is one of the best decades in their history, and perhaps, some would say, the greatest moment they've ever had. That moment is completely singular the intersection of four distinct and winding paths that speared off in more distinct directions still, some of which were forecast by the events of that day and some of which were absolutely not. Watford completely squandered the momentum offered up by Dini's goal, following it up with a loss in a final and then embarking on a lost season that binned their manager. While Leicester, the defeated semi-finalists, pressed on and immediately got promoted, and within two years were champions of the top flight against all odds. I think that divergence is part of what makes Steenie's goal special, and how much it doesn't fit in given what you might expect, given the wider stories of the clubs and players involved. Bill Leslie's television commentary of the play became famous and synonymous with the moment itself, such that Watford's highlight package of the game online is called Here's Hog Dini to match Leslie's words. Leslie's first comparison to capture the moment was to the final day. Nobody seems entirely sure exactly which final day he meant. But one possibility that I like is Sergio Aguero's famous winner against QPR that won the Premier League for Man City in the 90 plus 4th minute of the last match of the season. It was their first league title since 1968. That campaign though was a milestone in a multi-year rise for Man City that still continues to this day, as they remain arguably the best club in the world. We can point to Aguero's winners the first time where that trajectory began in earnest. That game is a well-marked point on the road that leads to Man City's current success. So many of this sport's great moments follow this pattern. They either cap off long stories or position themselves well along the way in those journeys. When we watch Maradona's goal of the century, it makes sense that it was on the way to winning the World Cup. When Abby Wambach tied the World Cup quarterfinal at the last possible moment, it only makes sense that they went on to win that match and then make the final. So many of the stories that I've talked about have their dramatic moments at key points in the story. In a sport replete with those stories whose climactic moments sum them up, Dini's winner at Vicarage Road is not that. Instead, The end of that match provides an extraordinary example where stories intersect, largely unrelated both before and after the event. Like four fireworks that meet, they combine for one brilliant flash, then fall out along their own paths. The ex-player turned manager in an unlikely situation, the journeyman who finally found a home, and two men, Troy Deeney and Anthony Knockart, with attacking flair and huge promise that they never quite fulfilled. One with a signature failure that marked his career, and the other representing the other side of that day. Having played the pivotal role in his club's greatest ever moment, cementing his place in club lore forever. 
May 12th, 2013, at Vicarage Road, stands alone, both from the paradigm of footballing moments and from the stories that created it. That's what makes it great. Thanks for watching.